الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله اشهد ان لا اله الا الله له لا شريك له له الحمد وله الملك يحيي ويميت بيده الخير وهو على كل شيء قدير وقل الحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا واشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله وصفيه وخليله ارسله الله للناس نذيرا وبشيرا ما آتاكم ما آتاكم الرسول فخذوه وما نهاكم عنه فانتهوا لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا محمد رسول الله والذين معه الشفتاء على الكفار وحماة من يطع الله ورسوله وأولي الأمر من المؤمنين فقد رشد ومن يعص الله ورسوله وكل الأمر من المؤمنين فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أوصيكم ونفسي أولا بتقوى الله وطاعته وأحذركم من عصيانه ومخالفة أمره أما بعد فإن خير الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار الله عز وجل وهو أصدق القائلين وأحق منهم في كتابه الكريم إن شر الدواب عند الله الذين كفروا فهم لا يؤمنون الذين عاهدت منهم ينقضون عهدهم في كل مرة وهم لا وهم لا يتقون فإما تفقنا فإما تفقنهم في الحرب فشرد بهم من خلفوا لعلهم يذكرون وإما تخافن من قوم خيانة فالبد إليهم فالبد إليهم على سواء إن الله لا يحب الخائنين ولا يحسبن الذين كفروا سببوا 
إنهم لا يعجزون وصدق الله العظيم Brothers and sisters, committed Muslims, those who fight for Allah's cause. As we continue to honor in these days the memory of the Prophet And we continue to try to build the level of consciousness that allows us to figure out how we can best implement his example and execute his prerogatives in our lives. It is heartening in the days that we live in to be a witness to the movement of liberation which is taking place what was typically known as the Arab world. Over in recent years, especially over the last 100 years, what was thought to be the Arab world was divided into 20 or 30 odd countries. And so the unity of these peoples came to be divided into scores of different nationalisms. And so we are a witness in the world that we live in today to the liberation which is taking place and perhaps down the road we may begin to witness a coalescence that confines these various nationalisms to the pages of history. But what do we do when we have power? It takes a certain amount of power to liberate yourself from an, estab- from an establishment and a system of oppression. Are we left out in the cold? To think for ourselves and to decide for ourselves that when we assume a position of decision making and that we are in the process of beginning to build and to shape that consciousness into a systemic approach to injustice that when we are in the very beginning that Allah Ta'ala leave us out in the cold to basically have us fend for ourselves until we get to a point of maturity where our systems are beginning to act in a way where we don't have to pay much attention to them. And the answer to that obviously has to be no. For Allah Ta'ala has provided us with all the answers that we need. And in particular, He has given us the answers that help us decide and formulate a path from where we are now to a position where we are demographically and geographically mature where the Islamic State is beginning to to exercise its power in a way that is addressing all of our needs and so right now we happen to be in a transitional phase and in that transitional phase Allah Ta'ala has given us the guidance that we need to help us navigate through that transitional phase 
so that we can get to a steady state of Islamic self-determination. A good portion of Surah Al-Anfal is related to how we manage through this transitional phase. And in particular today, we expect to focus on Ayah 55 to 60 of Surah Al-Anfal. These particular ayat were revealed to Allah's Messenger at a time when the battles of Badr and Uhud were already concluded. And Allah's Messenger والسلام, was in the process of negotiating certain treaties, contracts, covenants with those who were non muslim And indeed, when he himself got to Medina, one of the first orders of business on the itinerary of things that he had to do was to conclude the covenant of Medina. And that was concluded within the first year of his arrival in, in Al-Medina. And the objective of the covenant of Medina was to organize all of the power factions inside the city and in its suburbs into a pact where they would honor and protect the security of the city-state that was al Medina, the first Islamic state. It was a pact in which all of these power factions had never been organized before. But starting with this document, they all agreed to sign on to protecting the city-state of Medina not only with their bodies and their persons, but also with their finances. And this is identified in the Pact of Medina in at least two articles. And so after the Battle of Badr, and the Battle of Uhud, Some of these pacts and agreements that the Prophet ﷺ signed with these power factions, these agreements came to be tested. To help the Muslims understand who is going to be true to his word and who is not. So as far as some of these agreements are concerned, Allah Ta'ala is helping us understand that when we get ready to sign a treaty or an agreement with those who are not on the same page with us, that we ought to be apprised of certain characteristics of those we are signing an agreement with. And so the greater context of the revelation of these ayat in Surah Al-Anfal is a contractual and a treaty arrangement that the Prophet والسلام, had with the Jewish tribes inside of Medina and the Mushriks of Makkah. Part of this context concerns the tribe of Bani al nadir which happens to be one of the Jewish power factions, one of the three 
power Jewish faction in Al Medina. History books tell us that one of the companions of the Prophet by the name of Amr ibn Umayyah al Damari was captured and taken to Mecca where he was released. And so on his way back to Al Medina, he came upon two members of the tribe who had captured him. And he killed them. And when news of this incident reached the Prophet, he told the rest of the people that the tribe of whom the members were just killed that they were in a contractual agreement with the Prophet to protect the city of Medina. And that one of the articles in the covenant that were such a murder to take place, that the victims, the families of the bereaved, would be entitled to compensation. So it was determined that this companion of the Prophet, had murdered these two people. They were not responsible for kidnapping him and taking him to Mecca. Although there were other members of the tribe which were responsible for this crime. However, once this covenant of Medina was signed and agreed to, this idea of collective punishment ceased to exist. And so no member of a tribe could be punished for what another member of that tribe did, except that the one who committed the murder would have to come up with the compensation, the tutas, for the murdered family. And so the Prophet والسلام, went to the Muslims to try to collect the amount of this compensation that had to be given to the members of the murdered families or to the members of, of the families of the two people who were murdered. So as he went around to the Muslims, he discovered that they could not come up with the required amount to compensate these families. For the Islamic State was limited in its budget. It was new. The newly converted members of the Islamic State, the Muslims, most of them were poor people, or they were exiles from Mecca who were separated from their wealth in Mecca. And so the bottom line is he couldn't come up with that amount. And so under the covenant of Medina, The other parties to the covenant, meaning the Jews, had agreed that in instances of this nature, that they would make their finances available to help out in the political and the municipal functions of the state. And so the Prophet ﷺ approached And he asked them to make up the amount that was due to the families of the murdered individuals. And so he went to their to their fortifications right outside of Medina. And he made the case known to them. And so they asked him to wait outside the fortifications while they deliberated about whether they are going to make up the compensation or not. And so in the meantime, 
while Allah's Messenger was waiting for their decision, Allah Ta'ala informed him that they were hatching a plot on the inside of their fortifications to drop a rock on him while he was waiting outside to kill him. And so as he was informed about this, he immediately went back to al Medina, collected a force, and made siege of the fortification of Bani al Nadir. And then we know what happened thereafter. Bani al Nadir was expelled. They were allowed to take some of their possessions with them, but they were required to leave most of them behind. So we discover that in these ayahs, Allah Ta'ala is telling His Messenger that there is a characteristic of al ladina Shafalu. That if you engage in an agreement with them, that their tendency is to break that agreement. And he is making this known to all representatives of an Islamic executive authority that you are not forbidden from making agreements with the non-Muslims. But be careful that when you happen to be in a situation where your resources are constricted or where the odds are against you, that it that Alladina Kafaru and the non Muslims that you have made an agreement with will have a tendency to back out of their agreements when you need their help the most. There's only one other point given the weather and I think you can understand from these ayahs. Allah Ta'ala says وَلَا, وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَبَقُوا إِنَّهُمْ لَا يُعْجِزُونَ There is a tendency on the part of the Muslims that when they enter into agreement with non-Muslims and then they witness that these non-Muslims these scholars have backed out of these agreements there is a tendency on the part of the Muslims to begin to doubt themselves. This is what Allah Ta'ala is saying in this ayah. That do not think that by virtue of these people backing out of their agreement that they are going to secure an advantage. This is what Allah Ta'ala is saying. وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَبَقُوا إِنَّهُمْ لَا يُعْجِزُونَ They will never be supported. They will always be frustrated when they back out of their agreement. The only reason that this is like is because there is a tendency on the part of the Muslims to back in confidence. To back in confidence in Allah's words and in proceeding along the path to executing Allah's command. And so let us ask ourselves, why do we lack this confidence? Why are we Muslims with the example of Allah's Messenger? With the, incontrovertibi- with the incontrovertibility of this guidance in front of us? How is it possible for us to lack confidence? And the simple answer is that we do not have a public mind. We do not have a group consciousness. We do not have the wherewithal and the systems in place where we can confirm and corroborate the rightness of what we are doing by consulting with each other. We don't have this kind of mechanism in place. To further sustain the value of what is being said here, Think of when you have an idea. 
how do you test whether your idea is right or wrong? The way that you test it is by putting it out there and by having other people challenge you on the veracity of your idea. This gives you a chance to advocate it. This gives you a chance to support it. This gives you a chance to defend it. And the same is the case with the truth that comes from Allah. That unless we develop a group consciousness where we exchange amongst each other in an experiential way the value of this guidance to us and to the rest of humanity, we deprive ourselves of the chance to have confidence in Allah's guidance. We deprive ourselves of the chance to develop a public consciousness of what this guidance means. And so when we are forced to enter into treaty obligations as individuals, as opposed to entering into them with a group consciousness, then we begin to lose confidence because we are alone when we are challenged by others. And so that is why Allah Ta'ala is saying, وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَبَقُوا He is talking about الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا as a group. And indeed Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala's Messenger Himself says, that as far as the Kafirs are concerned, they are one body, one group of one mind. And Allah Ta'ala is trying to motivate us by virtue of these ayahs to be of one mind and of one public consciousness. <laughs> that are going on at the pace that they are going on with in the Arab world all the way from Morocco to Jordan there is unrest in almost every country whether to a large extent or to a lesser extent but there is a civil uprising which is rejecting a world order which does not represent the needs and the aspirations of the people. And it is being projected in the vast majority of the media that people have an access to that this is strictly an economic uprising that the people are short of food, that they're short of opportunities, they're short of education, they're short of living expenses. And that because they could not take this any longer, they consolidated into a civil uprising against the state authorities which put them in this position. And we have to resist the temptation of of accepting this analysis as true. For political liberation goes hand in hand with economic liberation. So we can take a look at the situation of other Muslim countries where there is a degree of economic stability and economic progress. But still and nonetheless the people are oppressed. And there are some countries in the Persian Gulf that fit that description. True economic liberation does not come without political representation. 
without free political representation. In the majority of the Muslim world, excepting perhaps two or three countries, there is a kind of political oppression which, com- which confines our economic progress to a few, to a few upper classes in the Muslim society. And so we have to ask ourselves that when we get ready to liberate ourselves, are we getting to ready to liberate ourselves only to put more money in the bank or to put more food in our stomachs? Or are we getting ready to liberate ourselves so that our children can be educated? So that they can be free to decide what kind of government they would like to see to represent their interests. And this goes much beyond putting more food into our stomachs. This goes to the heart and the meat of the issue. That if we really and truly want liberation, we have to rid ourselves of the systems which caused us in this position to be which caused us to be in this position to begin with. If I were to say that the majority of the country in which these liberation movements are taking place, if I were to say that all of these are democratic countries, most of us, anybody hearing that statement would say that I was a fool, that these cannot be democratic countries because of what we understand democracy to be. But listen to this for a minute. That if the rulers in these countries were to allow free representation, how long would they survive in the positions that they are in? They would never survive in the positions that they were in free representation 30 or 40 years ago. They might have been killed or something else might have happened to them where the situation would have been right for them to be replaced by someone else. And we have seen that script playing in Latin America. And so, their supporters, the tyrants who happen to be ruling over us, Their supporters claim democracy for themselves. These tyrants are proxies of people who claim democracy for themselves. And at the same time, if these people, these tyrants, were to allow self-representation and just representation in their society, the people who claim democracy for themselves would not support them. So you now tell me that in an experiential way, not just by words, whether the people who rule in Muslim countries, whether they are part of a democratic system or not. For the Democrats in the world who have power, support them. And were they to allow free representation, the Democrats in the world would never support them. And so we say today that these governments in the majority Muslim countries are democratic governments. But they are not free representative governments. And we ought to be able to make that distinction when we read Allah's guidance in the Qur'an, that we cannot conflate democracy with free representation. But there are many countries in the world 
where there is democracy, but there is no representation. And we have had to go far. We can see that right here in Washington. If the majority of the people in this country were queried today, they would be against the wars of aggression that this country has launched. And that would be representation, but it is not democracy. Democracy in the world that we live in, and, it, and what is trying to be promoted in these areas in the Middle East, the Islamic East, which has now been liberated. What is being promoted there is capitalism and the, and the deliberative mechanism that goes along with capitalism, which is democracy. But what is not being promoted is free representation. In the world that we live in, democracy is something which allows special interests to become entrenched in the public decision-making process. And when we talk about wanting democracy as a mechanism of political representation, are we suggesting to ourselves that we also want to entrench special interests into the public decision-making process? And no one in his right mind will tell you that this is what we want. We want to expel special interests from having control over the public skills, from having control over the public finances, and from directing these finances to satisfy the needs of a few and neglect the needs of the many. How is it possible, brothers and sisters, for us to engage in treaty obligations to those who represent these kinds of systems without being killed, without having our minds on our shoulders, without taking a thinking mind into these kinds of negotiations? and without taking the level of confidence with us that is required when we engage in negotiations of this nature. For at this transitional stage, before we become a mature geographic and demographic Islamic authority, at these beginning stages, we will have to enter into negotiations with our neighbors. There's no way around it. And the example of Allah's Messenger وسلم, and the guidance that comes to us in this surah indicates that for a time, as we begin to gain our maturity, we will have to enter into treaties, covenants, and contracts with non-Muslims. And Allah Ta'ala is advising us that when you enter into these obligations, be careful of the kind of people that you are dealing with. And we will end with just one example. The new leaders of Egypt are being threatened. They are being threatened by having to observe previous treaties or having to honor treaties that they say that Egypt entered into. And the chief among these treaties of course is Camp David. Now it is being said that Camp David is an agreement between Egypt and Israel. But what is not being said that Egypt is a complex society. It is a society of many constituents. It is a society that has leaders and that has leaders. It is a society where the majority of the people are less than two dollars. It is a society which has a military as a constituent. 
Is it in a society which has a business plan? And yet we are told that this agreement is between Egypt and Israel. But what we are not told is that this agreement was enacted by a person who was not elected. By a person who was not the representative of the people when he went to the negotiating table. And so how can it be characterized as an agreement between Egypt on the one hand and Israel on the other hand? What it ought to be characterized as Camp David, it ought to be characterized as an agreement between Anwar al-Sadat and Israel. But not an agreement between Egypt and Israel. Because he was not a rightfully chosen and a representative of the people of Egypt. And so when Allah Ta'ala says, وَلَا يَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَبَقُوا إِنَّهُمْ لَا يُعْجِزُونَ That we ought to approach the negotiating table with confidence when we say that everything is on the table. Nothing that an unrepresentative government agreed to is valid or legitimate. Everything is on the table. And isn't that what they tell us? When they get ready to bomb or declare war, an illegal war, and their media asks the leaders, what are you prepared to do in this war? They say that everything is on the table. And then they are asked, including the option to use nuclear weapons. And they say everything is on the table. And so where is our confidence? That when we approach these illegitimate agreements, which have handcuffed our political will, our Islamic will, our will to do justice, why can't we say that everything is on the table? Everything is up for negotiation until justice is done. And actually, who are we negotiating with? We have to keep this in mind because Allah Ta'ala is telling us in these ayahs that a characteristic of Alladina Kafaru. This is not everyone, but these are the ones who are systemically motivated to injustice. What is their characteristic? That if you enter into an agreement with them, they will violate that agreement. And so now news comes to us that the people that this agreement David that one of the parties to this agreement the Israelis that in the society that or in the world that we live in in the part of the world in that part of the world the Middle East the Islamic East that every economy in that area, almost bar none, from Morocco to Egypt to Syria to Jordan to even the Gulf economy, that they are suffering a shortfall. That the economies, of especially countries like Egypt, are in dire straits. But then we ask ourselves that if the whole region is in dire straits and the economy is suffering, how is it possible for the economy of Israel to be one of the most vibrant economies in the world? The, in the entire area is suffering. But there's one island in the middle that has one of the most vibrant economies in the world. How is it possible? Can anybody point to anything that they produce that you can buy here? 
Yeah, you might go to a grocery store and buy some fruits and vegetables that come from Israel. But how, is, how does that make this the most, one of the most vibrant economies in the world? Yeah, they are also the first largest armed distributors in the world. The United States is the largest. But look at the U.S. economy. How is it that there is no unemployment in the state of Israel? Or very low unemployment? So if they produce something, then how is it possible to, for them to have a vibrant economy? When they are paid for is that the state of Israel is a safe haven for the dirtiest money in the world. The state of Israel is a giant money laundering economy. And it is said, though it is very hard to corroborate some of this news, that right before Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, that they transferred $400 billion to three Israeli banks. And right before the oligarchs were expelled by Vladimir Putin in Russia, that they transferred the majority and the bulk of their assets to the state of Israel. And those oligarchs, the majority of them became Israeli citizens. And so if this state is the nexus of the dirtiest money in the world, how is it possible for us Muslims to enter into negotiations and peace deals with this kind of a country? How is it possible for the citadel of democracy and justice in the world to support peace deals with this country? And so when we enter into negotiations, we have to be cognizant of the characteristics of the people we are entering into negotiations with. And we ought to be holding them at arm's length, constantly verifying whether they are honoring their treaty obligations or not. And if they decide not to honor their treaty obligations, then we have to honor the words that Allah Ta'ala has given to us in these ayat of the Qur'an. وَإِمَّا تَخَافَنَّ مِنْ خَوْمٍ خِيَانَةً فَانْزِدْ إِلَيْهِمْ عَلَى سَوَاء إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحِبُّ الْخَائِنِينَ And if you fear treachery from those that you have treaty obligations with, from those with whom you have enacted a treaty with, if you fear treachery, then throw back the agreement in their faces so that you can be on equal footing. And indeed Allah Ta'ala does not love the treacherous. And so this is what he says in the treaty agreement with. They have been treacherous. Let us be on equal footing, but not by dissolving this so called agreement. Allahumma alina al haqqa haqqa wa zukna tiba. Wa alina al basila basila wa zukna jtinaba. اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات إنك قريب سميع مجيب دعوات اللهم ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عطيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا في ما أعطيت اللهم أبرم لهذه الأمة أمر رشدي يعز فيه أهل طاعتك ويذل فيه أهل معصيتك ويؤمر فيه بالمعروف وينهى فيه عن المنكر إنك على كل شيء قدير اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي قصر 
كل الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر في هسمه وسعى في قرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعيدكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة